Hey, it's David Kay, voice of Beast Wars Megatron and TFA Optimus. You're listening to the Geek Cast Radio Network. My name is Optimus Prime, and this episode of Transformation Animation Podcast features Stephen C. Phillips, Mike Blanchard, and Michael Wilson. With these infernal setbacks never end, the revolution begins now. <laughs> Did you just put the microphone to your ass? What was that? All right, I'm going on mute, so... You can begin. Hello and welcome to episode five of Transformation Animation Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Steve Joe and Mike, and joining me is Steve Megatron. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. And Pecan Court Michael, hello. Hey, how's it going? It's going. Good. Uh yes, we are here with episode five. Uh Steve, what have you been up to? Working on just random voice crap at this point and playing Diablo 2 to kill time. Cool. Michael, what's going on in the house of Wilson? Uh, not a whole lot. I actually found a Sergeant Cup. I was very excited about that because I didn't think I was going to find any of the, uh, you know, the last of the generations line, but I did find him, and I was kind of happy about that. Uh, I also got uh, my Transformer Collectors Club sideburn in the mail, and that was nice. exciting. Yeah, because he's, you know, he's kind of like a, a blue repaint. Of classics, uh, Rodimus. Rodimus. Yeah, he he looks really cool. I always like these figures because they they don't skimp on the paint job, unlike Hasbro. <laughs> so yeah. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of you know little uh, flourishes on him. It's just really really sharp. And I uh, was seeing a bunch of pictures on like Flickr and another side, TwitPic and things like that, uh, of people posting pictures of him, and I was like, where's mine? Yeah, <laughs> uh, and I can't. Yeah, hold everybody it. is like, "Oh my God, the T the the TCC has has sent stuff out. When are they going to show up? Oh my God, this person has it, but this person doesn't. This person got theirs, but that person didn't get theirs yet. And it's yeah. like, oh my, like I, 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 I don't know if it's love for the character of Sideburn or if it's just that they wanted a blue Rodimus. I just don't get it it's like <laughs> it's kind of like you dipped him in the blue lagoon or something like that and it's like holy crap this figure is oh, oh you know and, a holy grail it. for people and it's like what the fuck yeah no this this is a an homage to a robots in disguise character right and you, no, and, no, and you I never watch that. robots yeah, in disguise um, no. yeah um, I mean, if you don't that's... watch Robots in the Skies, you're not going to catch the homage. They actually did do a red repaint of this character uh, and called it, you know, Super Sideburn. I think that's his actual name. <laughs> <And> Super, <laughs> Side, Super Sideburn uh, looked a lot like Rodimus Prime, and it was a big homage to G1 Prime or G1 Rodimus. Right. Yeah. But, no, uh, I understand that it's an homage to the character from from our ID and all this and all that, but it's like. It, guys, it's just a blue Rodimus with a different paint scheme on the head. But but it's like everybody's like like scrambling, like grabby hands, gimme, 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 gimme. It's like well, I think that. yeah, I think it's basically like this guy got it, why didn't I get it? And you're literally at the mercy of the postal system. Yeah, let's not get into a great debate about that. Yeah. yeah so I think it was last episode that we had the um is it episode four episode three where they were in the construct the oh no it was let's fuck i don't remember when oh, they were in the abandoned plant the meltdown episode okay uh on, on dinobot island the abandoned research facility or whatever else where yeah it was the last episode um the way I explain the fact that the toilet has a keyhole is because that every single thing in or around the Detroit area in the last 50 years in this universe was 
happened or built because Sumdac reverse engineered Megatron's technology, so it's Cybertronian technology. Uh, one of our friends and fans on Twitter, Salem Blood, she was going to call in a voicemail, but at the time the voicemail line was kaput. Uh, it is back up now, 502-526-5821. <clears throat> but she made a response to why she thinks that the, that the toilet had a keyhole. <laughs> she says, first of all, consider where this particular toilet is. Fanzone said it's in an abandoned research facility, and Meltdown would most likely be working in the biological department of the labs therein. In some cases, research scientists would be collecting urine and feces from the test subjects, so would need to lock the toilet's ability to flush so the test subject does not accidentally lose the needed research material. After such a toilet is then unlocked to dispose of any waste not needed for testing in normal use. Um, holy wow. crap. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, 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 Salem, I'm sorry. That is... Just so off the wall, I it's cannot believe genius. it. Genius! That is brilliant. <laughs> it's so true. I can't. I can't imagine why I didn't think of that. <laughs> well, it's kind of true, but again, as I said in episode four, it more so goes to the fact that the, it's a Cybertronian toilet. It's not even a real. It, it's not you know. It's not a toilet. You can get at Bed Bath and Beyond. Or Home Depot, or it's, I wouldn't call it a Cybertronian toilet because it's not big enough for you know Optimus Prime <laughs> no. to land his ass on. Oh, no. <laughs> I've got my own theories about what that is. The reason why I say <laughs> it's, it's a Mr. Cybertronian Thirsty. toilet is because it's a it's a it's a piece of Cybertron tech, and the only key that fits that thing is is Sari's key. So that's I don't know. Steve, what are your theories? <laughs> Are you sure wait. you want to hear my theories? Might um, as well. We've already gone down the hole this episode already, <laughs> so. Well, one one reason is, um, well, maybe it's used to, uh, you know, you got to take crap, use the key, you flush. Sorry, it goes down the hole. Uh, down the hole. Sorry, you go down the hole. <laughs> but uh, um, the other one is to remove shitty episodes from the lineup. Because, <laughs> you know, they literally hit the can. Uh, we don't see Professor Princess for a while, so maybe that's where she went. But, uh, uh, the other thing is, well, you know, that's that's their, uh, their thought process for some of the episodes prior and coming from uh, this episode on. They get their ideas from the crapper. Oh. Okay. I do my best thinking on the they, crap. They, they they turn the key, and out comes some crap. <laughs> Jiggle the handle. And let's see what comes out. Yeah, that's all I got, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're gonna get into some episodes. Wow, this has been a train wreck of an intro. <laughs> Eight minutes and twenty three seconds of pure gold. <laughs> pure gold. We're digging for gold. In the craft air. Up the ass, you know. <laughs> Just so awful. Oh, I'm not even sitting down anymore. <sighs> Mark. Okay, we just have to go back to town and get Prime and Ratchet. They'll know how to fix Prowl. And the best part? We finally get out of this stupid nature! But won't Prowl follow us and spread space barnacles all over Detroit? <laughs> It's not fair. Why do you have to be so right all the time? All right, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> what road? The low road. The low road. <laughs> the low road. Best episode in Beast Wars. The oh. low road. <laughs> Bitch slap you. <laughs> all right, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. First up today is Nature Calls. Prowl is frustrated by humans plowing snow and the fact that neither Bumblebee nor Sari seem to care. Optimus Prime discovers a non-sentient Cybertronian energy signal, and Sari, Prowl, and Bumblebee set off to investigate. Sari attempts to teach Bumblebee the fine rustic art of camping, but he is not the least bit interested in roughing it. Their semi-peaceful vacation is soon disrupted when they have run in with a parasitic space barnacles. 
that have apparently taken over the Cybertronian body of their thought to have been deceased enemy Megatron and end up taking over Prowl and Bumblebee. Sara uses hot water to destroy the space barnacles. Her Autobot friends are rescued, but Ozzy Sumdak finds the body and takes it back to his lab to rebuild it. Now, it is never, and again, these these synopsises that I have are from wikipedia.org. It is never actually said in the episode that the space barnacle thing, monster thing, was Megatron's body. They kind of come close at the end at hinting, because... Yeah. Well, you have to you have to take a big leap because first of all, you've got this. Basically, it's a it's a robot covered in barnacles as a monster with spike hands or pickaxe hands, and then at the end, some deck finds a big pile of something with a Decepticon logo on it. So it's yep. like, well, is that Megatron's body? Or, I mean, at this point, it could, it could possibly be Lugnut's body or Blitzwing's body because they were blown up and. Starscream found them, but we never really found out what happened to their bodies. Well, it, it couldn't be Lugnut because it was gray with a purple Decepticon symbol on it, so... Right. Well, it's not actually until the next episode where he says, Look what I found! and pulls the sheet off it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. He says, Hubza! You know. Did you guys see the, the actual real human spark plug in the very beginning? Yes. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Yeah, I like the uh, the G one construction worker outfit. I yep. mean that that's that's iconic, and, and I dig it that they that this is like the second, maybe the third time they've brought that back now. But uh, I also liked the uh, the mining robots in the mine with with uh, spark plug because they're oh, they're, yeah. they're constructicon green and purple. Yeah, and my first thought was, oh my god, is it going to be constructicons? That, that see th that's the thing I hadn't seen this episode in so long since my very first watch through of the series. Yeah. That's what I thought too, and then I realized, oh wait, that doesn't happen until much later in the series, as yeah. far as the Constructicons. Um, At least but, the Constructicons looked like construction equipment, whereas yeah. these just look like boxes with pickaxes on the end. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I guess there's a first time for everything. This is the first time and the probably only time I can sympathize with Bumblebee. Uh, and I am so not a, a fan of camping. I just... God. Every time I ever went camping as a kid, it always turned into a nightmare just because... Ugh. <laughs> I um, solved that problem by not going camping. Exactly. Well, when your parents, you know, as kids, when your parents sign you up for summer camp, you kind of have to, oh, you know. Yeah, uh, that never happened to me. I went camping once. I think I was, I think I was twenty-one the first time I went camping, and, uh, you know, I didn't bring sunscreen. I didn't, didn't. I just didn't know how to camp, and I ended up with like second and third degree burns from, wow. from sitting out at the beach. Ah. Uh, yeah. It was really, really bad, and you know I'm pale skinned anyway. It just didn't turn out very well for me. Uh, you must learn to survive without the aid of machines. You never know when you won't have them. This is such a scary thought in this day and age. <laughs> no, seriously, think about this. In Everybody a world is where reliant. machines are no longer existent, you are alone. Seriously, exactly. the, 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 this is almost a discussion point for a Geek Cast Radio episode because if you really think about this, it is that line is so true because we have computers, we have iPads, we have iPhones, we have iPods, we have Blackberries, we have uh, you know other touchpad stuff, right? The right. internet, you know, where would we be right now if we didn't have any of this stuff? No, the We'd all be going stir crazy. Yeah, no, the decline of civilization will start when the power ends. <laughs> when, when they shut... Stone Age. Exactly. When they shut down the power grid and we no longer have refrigeration, entertainment, uh well modern entertainment, let's say. You know, we can no longer drive our cars or fly our planes. But we can still that, kick it. That's can. it. <laughs> well, <laughs> still because... kick. Exactly. <laughs> that's about all we can do. We can kick a can down the street and pray that you know, road warrior esque bikers don't drive up and slaughter us. Yeah. 
Um, I love how Sari wants to get in on the action facing the barnacle monster by making a fucking snowball. <laughs> Because there's that action pose of Bumblebee Prowl, and then two seconds later, Sari comes in. She's in this action pose, but she's got a snowball in her hand. You can do a lot of damage with a snowball if you aim it right. Yeah, it's like, mm-hmm. ow! That was that had ice in it. Ow! Ow! That's not a snowball. That's a slush ball. There's a big difference. Ow! <laughs> ow! Stop it! Uh. <laughs> I love how Jeff Bennett does the inflections for Prowl when he's calm and when he's really pissed because the first part he goes to Bumblebee, do you mind? And Bumblebee's like, what? I didn't do anything. And then later, and then like two seconds later, Prowl gets hit by snow. And, and we've seen that Sorry has a snowball. And, and as soon as he says the first, do you mind? He turns to her like, do you mind? Do you mind? Yeah. What? That wasn't me. <laughs> The giant barnacle monster over your head. Why are you looking at me like that? I, yeah. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and sorry again with her comedy in this. <laughs> That's right, Barnacle Boy. Come get some nice, tasty Autobot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So hilarious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, it was You're funny. You're so easily amused, you know. <laughs> well, it's funny because then, she, because later, then she has the line of of um, you know, bath time kids, and yeah. I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if Tara ever uses any kind of voice like that with her own children. <laughs> Probably, I know when she said that, my kids both went. <gasps> <laughs> Did they? They did. Well, we were all watching it together, and she's like, bad time, kids. And, you know, it's like, no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, good times. I, I just don't... I understand them why they put this episode in here. It's basically, the only reason why it's here is to get across the message of, oh, we need, you know... It's more of the message of technology and nature working together, you know, that trans tech type of crap. Well, uh, this is basically a Prowl story. Prowl has yeah. been bitching and whining about nature for the last several episodes, and yeah. this is finally where it hits home. Secondly, this episode is where they find Megatron's body. That's well, well, well that's what I was going to say. It's it's two. The, the, there's only two reasons for this episode to exist. The nature versus technology thing, and the fact that they finally found the rest of Megatron's body. I mean, other than that, this episode is completely useless, I think. Agreed. I thought it was funny. Do you have any notes for it, Steve, for Nature Calls? Um, I think the whole barnacle thing's retarded. Now, was (laughs) the space barnacles, is that some sort of homage or some sort of, like, are space barnacles kind of like rock lords where it's like, oh my god, the super homage of this super fandom thing? Is that, or is it just that, oh, these are just space barnacles? I don't know what the hell a rock lord is, so that's... Oh. Um, I know what a rock lord is. It's a He-Man yeah. thing. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, rock lord. I, I think they were pulling from the Japanese tentacle porn of the Kiss play. Oh god. <laughs> there were actually tentacles involved here. I know. And they grew up the robots and created new robots out of rocks. That's right. They became rock'em, I, sock'em robots. I think Bumblebee brought along some soda, and it was grape. It was actually labeled tentacle grape. Oh, my God. I did not catch that. I'm kidding. It's, it was not true. I think. Oh, thank God. I'm just messing with you. Yeah, don't do not do that again. Or there was is he? such a thing as a tentacle grape soda, though. You can get it on uh, Japanese websites. Oh my god! And eBay yeah. for forty nine ninety five. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know how much it costs. Yeah, you, know, you can get it by the case. That's it tastes ridiculous. like grape. Or the leader. <laughs> it's very purple. Anything else for nature calls, Steve? Um, I pretty much agree with you. Other than Megatron's, you know, lifeless shell being in this episode and trying to show. The balance and needing, you know, machines and, you know, all that crap. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's a pretty useless episode. Other than that, but I, I do like how they did show, uh, Sparkplug. 
Yeah, that was pretty cool. Spark what about you, being... Michael? What do you got for nature calls? Oh, I was just going to say spark plug being eaten by tentacles. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was the last we saw of spark plug. Um, I like the uh, the irony of Prowl's fixation on nature. Yeah, and how it's uh, it's like he's the whole time he's like, you have to get away from machines, and he is a machine. And yeah. Bumblebee so much as points that out. He's like, uh, you do realize that you're a machine too. Bumblebee not only points that out, but Bumblebee tries to use it to his advantage to get his media player going. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then he crushes his media player. See, I, I think toward the end of this episode, it tried dipping into into like a horror sh horror story, you know, like the, the zombies. Uh, it, it, the real horror here is losing your DVD player. <laughs> that, to me, that's just really scary. I don't think I'd want to be in that situation. No more movies. No. <laughs> well, it starts off, you know, you got Bumblebee and Sari playing the video games, and. You'd think that in the future they'd have huge screens, but no, they've got this little tiny little 14-inch screen on top of an Xbox or something. Just goes to show you that our technology is still superior than the future. <laughs> well, right. well, the other thing about that, that, since you bring that up, Michael, about them not having a, a huge TV, yeah. you got to think, Sari's, what, eight, nine-year-old little girl? Yes, her father has all this money and all this technology at his plant, but... It would look kind of weird, the Autobots going to some deck tower and having, you know, Bulkhead or Bumblebee or anybody carry away, you know, like a 70-inch flat panel TV. <laughs> Bigger Back, than that. I mean, you yeah. know, <laughs> it would look really weird. I, I don't know. Uh, if you look at an, another uh, Wyatt, you know, related show, Teen Titans, when you go to the T-shaped the tower, I forget what they call it, like Teen Titans Tower or something. Yeah, the... the yeah, the Titan's Tower. The Titan Tower. Uh, when you go in there, what's the first thing you see uh, Robin and Beast Boy doing every episode? They're playing video games on this, you know, 50-foot-long screen. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking if I was 40 foot tall, wouldn't I want a 50-foot, <laughs> you know, wide television? <laughs> I mean, they could use it for other things rather than just playing video games, but still. Right. That would be that would be the first on my to-do list. You know, it's like uh, cleaning up the floor. No, cleaning up the the you know the, the surrounding area. No, fixing the windows. No, getting a giant TV is my priority here. So and you as much said video. that in one of your blog posts. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <right. laughs> I back this up with experience. That's true. <laughs> oh. Uh, I like, I like when Sari is like camping trip. <laughs> She's all excited. She's never been camping. Not <laughs> once. It's like you realize you're gonna be out there even without giant barnacle monsters. Camping is a fight for your life. You know, you are. It's it's easy to stand your ground against nature when you live in a house and you've got food in the fridge and there's you know the uh, hot and cold running water you go out there in the forest and you're no longer top of the food chain no <laughs> it's just like uh, yeah so i can kind of understand bumblebee wanting to take all the stuff with him but <laughs> i think it's funny because he brings too much stuff and uh, Ralph's like, where did you even fit all of that? Places you don't want to know about. <laughs> I'd rather not talk about it. Yeah, it's it's he it brings a new meaning to the term junk in the trunk because he puts yeah. it in his ass, you know. <laughs> he says, It's in my ass, sit down and rotate. That's it. <laughs> exactly. He's like, Don't take my DVD player. Why not? You don't want to know where it's been. <laughs> I'll make it so you never want that bastard ever again. I know. I just stuck it out of your back so I can watch TV. Don't touch it. It's been in my exhaust port. And that's what I was Optimal. talking about. Not not just at the plant, but even out in the woods. Again, Bumblebee points out to Prowl, you are a machine. And he tries using him again as a projector. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, who goes camping in the winter in Detroit? It's got to be cold. Uh, yeah, that's a little weird. And you know it's cold because there's snow on the ground. Well, that's true, but 
let's not forget why they were out there in the first place to find this this signal. But still, I wish they would have made it more about finding the signal rather than oh hey camping trip yay. <laughs> well, why, why not go camping while you're out there in the middle of nowhere in the middle of winter? You know, and they want to go camping, and they get out there, and what do they find? Space herpes. <laughs> Brought by Megatron. <laughs> Completely coding Megatron. So, uh, yeah, space barnacles that ha- that are mutated by dark energy. Ah, uh, see how I'm pulling this all together here? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, it's not really dark energy. Just no. I I saw it. I yeah. told the court, but I saw it. He'll show you his energy cave. So is that speaking? Speaking. Okay. Speaking of the cave, the cave. and Bumblebee's genius of locking them in there with uh, space barnacle prowl, uh, that cave actually will come back later because that's the same. Well, yeah, we'll Probably see that location about. again. We do. Put it to you that way. All right. I, I forget exactly where the cave could. Be. Yeah. Um, I'll remember uh, later. Yeah. yeah, you'll remember later. Yeah. Anything else on nature calls? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, yeah, speaking of that cave, that's what really shocked me is that the solution here is for them to go back to the mine where the scary monster lives. Because, you know, they don't know that the scary monster hasn't come back yet. Yeah. It's almost like, let's all split up and wander out into the dark and wait for the killer to catch us. And... It was Professor Plum in the in, in the lab in, in in the cave <laughs> with an Energon herpy. <laughs> Energon herpy. Yeah, but no, I like the whole zombie out thing. The the zombie uh, the, the the zombie take Prowl gets zombie fight first, and yep. then he uh, he takes a swing at Bumblebee and he's like too slow, but he's not. He actually zombie fights him. Uh, zombie Bumblebee. I just I I I like this idea. I mean, they're not really dead. They're not really zombies, you know. But they're they have the arms up. They're like, Arr! you know, they're they're more yeah. like rage virus victims. I, I guess would be the word. Yeah, they're like hybrids. <laughs> hybrid. I like hybrid, uh, hybrid hate plaguers. <laughs> hi, hi. Yeah, that that too. <laughs> I like uh, when he says, "Why is water coming out of the fire hose?" <laughs> <laughs> I had to go. <laughs> well, he gets the fire hose, and he's like, "All right, watch out!" <laughs> it shoots water, and he's like, "Why isn't there fire coming out of the fire hose?" <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> well, you know, it, it it all leads back to you know things being improperly labeled. Like, <laughs> you know, if you're in a grocery store and you see a jar that says baby food, you know, clearly it's a jar of food made out of babies, right? Oh, well, it's like it's fat free. It comes with fat for free. Okay, keep keep going. <laughs> We're a very imaginative bunch of Americans. Exactly. Oh my God. I got a whole bottle of applesauce here. It says apple right on the front. I have a whole bottle of baby food here. It has a baby right on the front. Okay, stop. Just right. back to the episode. <laughs> All right, so they can't get fire to come out of the fire hose, but they do get it to, to produce steam. And they do this. How do they do this? Sorry, they... swings her key at, at the fireplace. Now, we just got off a discussion on why is there a keyhole in a toilet, but there's no keyhole in the mine. No, it, it is there. It doesn't work, though. It is there. When she first goes into the room and she goes over to that control panel, a keyhole does show up, but it won't work because the mine systems are shut down. And then she sees the fireplace. She goes over to the fireplace, and why that there's... There, there's a hot coil in the fireplace or oven or whatever it's supposed to be. Yeah. You know, she starts striking her key against the hot coil, kind of like, you know, striking a match to, you know, right. piece So she of wood. finally, at the end of the camping episode, she finally learns how to make fire. Yeah. Mm, fire, good. <laughs> <laughs> she makes fire. That, in turn, makes steam, and the steam kills the barnacles, and they're all like, it's a sauna in here. Yeah. But yeah, at the very end, behold, the monster was actually Megatron's body, and it was brought back to life with, with uh, the nasty zombie space barnacles. So, I mean, it, it, it all comes together at the end, and it makes perfect sense, but the, 
the main goal of the episode was to get Megatron's body back without having to, you know, resort to Destronium or stealing a body from Soundwave or something. Yeah. All good plans, but, you know, getting your original body back is probably the best plan of all. Yes, and there will be much more tentacles when that happens. Those are so creepy. We'll talk about that in the next episode. So are we done with nature calls? Yeah, that covers it. All right, we are moving on. I am ready to serve as your ever-faithful second-in-command. Ah, Starscream. How fitting to have you by my side as I finally take my revenge on the one responsible for my 50 stellar cycles of helplessness and humiliation. <laughs> Anyone else have a problem with my leadership? No, we're fine. Never! Now where was I? Huh? After them! And finally up today is the Megatron Rising 2-parter. In the first part we have Starscream, Blitzwing, and Lugnut begin their attack upon Earth. Optimus Prime demands that Sari hand over her key to the Autobots. She refuses and Ratchet uses his magnets to forcefully take it from her. This causes her to run away only for her to end up captured by Black Arachnia. Optimus begins to doubt his leadership while Megatron begins his next stage to have his body rebuilt and orders Lugnut and Blitzwing to steal the key from the Autobots. They succeed in doing this. Starscream, when scanning Lugnut, learns that at last Megatron is really alive. After thinking a little, he decides to join up with his former leader until the next good opportunity to get rid of Megatron presents itself. So Starscream arrives to the Sundak Tower, where Megatron's head is placed and has tried to convince him of his loyalty, but he doesn't suspect that Megatron already knows about his treachery. At the end of the episode, Optimus watches in horror as Megatron rises into the sky, his body having been fully rebuilt by Isaac Sumdak and the key. <laughs> well, these infernal setbacks never end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I like that. Uh, Megatron's head is just about to lose it. <laughs> just like, you know what? <laughs> I am running out of patience with you. I'm going to bite your fucking head off. I mean... It was just, uh, it was just funny that you know he completely just freaks out on on some deck at the at the last second. Yep, I like Starscream's line uh, because Lugnut keeps saying, "Oh no, it's Megatron! Megatron's in my head!" Blah blah blah. Starscream's like, "Megatron? Did you just say Megatron? Did he just say Megatron? There is no Megatron! Megatron is offline, terminated. I did it myself. I saw it myself." <laughs> I got the impression that he was uh I don't want to say backpedaling but you know the fact that he he doesn't really want to admit that he killed Megatron. <laughs> you know, he doesn't want to say I did it myself cuz then you know Lugnut's probably going to execute him right there on the spot. Yeah. Um uh so Bumblebee is getting tons of character development. Uh but watch, they'll take it away soon enough. This this two-parter, I so found Bumblebee to be much more appealing than the entire rest of the season. <laughs> uh, well, is that just because you feel sorry for him that he gets his ass handed to him by Starscream? No, it's just... He's not being a dick. He, Prime, Optimus Prime is the one that's being a dick in this episode. I mean, Bumblebee's pointing out to him, you know, they are just maintenance bots and this, that, and the other thing. And even though Optimus has had the the Elite Guard training and all this and all that, he's not making good decisions throughout this entire episode. Um, I did... I don't know if anyone else will pick up on this, and I'm sure that people will get the reference um, when they hear the the quotes that I put in the episode, but I love Prime's line of, it appears the Decepticons are mobilizing for a full-scale assault. And silence, because neither one of you guys get it. 
I in the beginning, no. in the beginning <laughs> of Transformers the movie, Ironhide, we don't have enough energon cubes to power a full scale assault. Yeah. Uh, okay. They just and when to use the David same K's Optimus says this line about the Decepticons mobilizing for a full scale assault, it sounds similar to what Optimus said in G1. Is is the whole point? I'm not sure if I buy that. It, you can listen to it in the episode later. <laughs> okay. Uh, Starscream finds Megatron, and he can't mask joyous emotions at all. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that Megatron says? I can see the joy in your face. I, know, yeah. I see the delight written all over your face. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> uh. Uh, Lugnut is a Wayne's World groupie. Master, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. <laughs> you know, it's funny because you, you brought that up, the the Wayne's World reference, and I didn't get it. <laughs> it, just, it went right over my head. So I'm kind of <laughs> glad that you spelled it out for me there. It makes much more sense now. <sighs> oh, when, oh, you're talking about on Twitter when I made the teaser about Lugnut and – yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, right over my head. I did not catch that at all. Sorry. Yeah, no. Uh, Sumdak feels sorry for himself, but uh, hello, he has seen an Autobot symbol before, and he saw the Decepticon symbol on Megatron's old body. How dumb are you, dude? <laughs> the giant Decepticon symbol on Soundwave that you yeah you didn't notice that? <laughs> I know. Well, he is a scientist. He he doesn't actually pay attention to things. Uh, I would have much rather have had Beekman in place of Sumdak in this instance. <laughs> Beekman? <laughs> I love this show. <laughs> With the giant rat. <laughs> oh, that was a great show. And... And at the end, Optimus is like, no, it can't be. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> new Megatron. Steve, what did you have for the uh, the first part of the episode? Well, the first part, uh, I like the cybernetic Megatron image. Yeah. That's just, that's so reminiscent of Beast Machines, it's not even funny. The, the but it's a now? damaged one. It's a damaged model, though, which is even better because it shows that, oh, mighty Megatron, even in cybernetic state, is still fucked up. He's You're talking about when the key overtakes him, right? Yes. Yeah, he's talking about when... The blue lines? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I do like, I I feel the... like his royally screwed up looking body, though, and missing the head yeah. and arms and all the that does, chunks. That does rule. When I saw it, though, I thought that, that was more of an homage to uh, uh, the 1986 movie, when when Megatron gets reformatted into Galvatron. I could see that too, but at the same time, it's almost it's kind of more of both. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah. No. I mean, I I agree. I. I just saw it as a really cool image. Um, and, of course, it's it's more so, I would almost have to agree with Michael, because it's more so recharging him. And, yes, it is reformatting him into a new body, but just that image of his head still in its same position, but it's yet getting recharged. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's cool. Put back together. And as it was happening, there was that uh, that classic G1 transformation sound. Yep. Yeah, I like that. that I like cool. the shot of his eyeball when the eyeball start his left eye when it starts the the pieces start coming over his eyeball and you can actually see the eyeball being rebuilt not the eyeball yeah. itself but the eyelid the the, the area well, around the, the eyeball the musculature around the eye reformats and he looks pissed. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like I have an eye and this is my angry eye. Grr. <laughs> I'm going to put the eye on you, yeah. the evil eye. <laughs> yeah, but that was, just an, that was an epic scene. Oh, yeah, it was. What else you got for part one, Steve? I love the final reveal of his new body. 
Yeah, oh, when he bursts out of the roof? When he's got his new helicopter mode and he's... No, that's in part two. Or his uh, robot mode, I mean. Yeah. You only barely see the robot mode in part one. You see it up in the sky. You don't really see a close-up of it, but you obviously know it's Megatron. I like that so much better than his Cybertronian form. Yeah. The Cybertronian form was okay. I, I don't really care it for the It looked too ult- movie-esque. This looks badass. No, it do, it does look badass. I I do like. I almost wish animated would have come slightly before the movie, and they then the movie would have copied animated because I like the Cybertronian Megatron head in animated way better than any of the Megatron head designs in the movies. Meh. I yeah, I mean you know my take on the, the movie Megatrons. I don't I don't like any of them. Yeah, no, I don't either. Yeah, no. I actually, I think the one of the third movie is a little more forgiving because he looks. Well, first of all, he's a Mack truck, and he kind of looks like he could transform into a Mack truck. But when you look at his face, it's still that uh, crumpled tinfoil. Yeah, he just doesn't look right. Yeah, not to me. I, I also like the uh, the line Starscream says, "Who does who interrupts my speech?" Which is like, "Who disrupts my coronation?" Yeah. Yeah, you interrupted my speech. Yeah. And see, I I knew this, and again, for for right now, Kevin, you're either going to have to stop the show or you're going to have to fast forward because I am going to be putting in spoilers right now. So I'm spoil telling you right it. now, dude, stop listening. Don't spoil it. When Well, no, I'm not going to spoil too much, but when, th- this whole thing of Starscream coming back, Megatron getting his body and all this and all that, and I'll, I'll bring it up. Uh, later but when Megatron finally found out who actually betrayed him and Megatron punches said person yeah Megatron has a certain artifact in his hand when he punches that person and that's how that person got his uh, no that's not how he got his power yes that is anyway the the, the anyway giant, we, we the can't go any further his forehead doesn't <laughs> anyway uh, that's not how he got his power, I don't think. All right. Uh, Steve, anything else from part one? I believe he stabbed his own forehead. Thank you very much. But um, that's Did besides he? the fact. Uh, no, that's <laughs> all I got. I don't remember. Michael, uh, part uh, one. Yeah, starting off with uh, how Prime manages to piss everybody off. Yeah. I mean, he's just... Uh, he's just uh, not very nice to anybody here. Optimus and... Prime in this entire two-parter up until the very end is even more douche. He has more douchebaggeriness to him than Rodimus ever did in G1. <laughs> Douchebaggery. Well, you know, I understand he's stressed out. He's under a lot of pressure here. Uh, and couple that with the fact that he just finds out that uh, uh, Prowl and Bulkhead lied about the Dinobots. Yeah. He had no idea the Dinobots were even still around. And he's like, oh, my God, this is all on top of my head. I'm going to be a giant, giant dick here. Yeah. Or a dying kick, as I was about to say. I'm sorry. Uh, speaking dyslexically. Uh, so everyone's pissed off. Everybody goes their separate ways, some, sometimes uh, against orders. And who shows up? But Black Arachnia. So now we have two girls commiserating over being let down by Optimus Prime. It's like, yeah, that Optimus sure is a dick. You know, he left me behind, and now I look ugly. Look at me. Oh, ugly. You know, sorry he's pissed off because Optimus Prime took her key away. And honestly, eight-year-old girls should not be carrying around Cybertronian artifacts, especially not the way she's been using it for the last dozen odd episodes. But, you know, would it hurt so bad... To give Black Arachnia her robot body back. Is it is it such an awful thing to actually just take her to the Allspark and have the Allspark heal her? Because you know the Allspark could heal her if it was in its you know finished state. It probably could, but they've specifically said before that without her organic half, her robot body can't survive. It's she because that she, that she is a direct homage to Beast Wars. Yeah. It's kind of like, 
oh, hey, we're on this strange planet with all these energon deposits. We need to create beast forms or some alternate form to protect our, cyber, you know, protect our robot bodies. It's the same thing here. Because she has two halves to herself, one can't survive without the other. I, see, I don't know if I can buy that because even Beast Machine's Megatron was able to rid himself of his organic half eventually. True. I mean, he Not had without to having about... to destroy himself first. Well, yeah, that too. But, you know, we, we've already seen that the key can revive dead Cybertronians or dead Autobots, you know, in the case of Optimus yeah. uh, in the original movie. But why why couldn't the the source of the key, right, why couldn't the Allspark remove her organic half, which may kill her, but then revive her right back again? I mean, it could, I believe it could work, I, and I, I just don't see the point in you know, or I have an idea. Her. Use protoforms and take her spark and move it. <laughs> you know, it's funny too because this is a series where they actually, where they actually bring up that 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 exact subject. It's much later with uh, Jazz and Yokotron. Spoilers, but uh, yeah, you can do that. You can take someone's spark out and put it in the protoform. You know, they don't have any protoforms handy while they're stranded on Earth, but. You know, they do have the most powerful Cybertronian artifact in, in the known universe. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. I I think we just had an episode, the camping episode, you know, about how bad it sucks to be part robot and part organic. You're a zombie. Brr, space barnacle, you know? Yeah. I mean, granted, Black Arachne is not a zombie. But yeah. still, you know, she's she's just grievously unhappy with her life. And... And honestly, if she could be cured, she might, maybe possibly, end up going to the good side. And isn't that worth, you know, giving her a little, little face time with the Allspark? Yeah, I think it is. She might go to the the light side of Optimus Prime shorts. That's. <laughs> oh my God! Not the skidded side. No, that's where Sentinel goes. Ah. Um, <laughs> well, she, she can't go to the other side because that's where they keep old Yeller. Oh wow! Where's my Magnus not, hammer? Yeah, we, <laughs> we're not, not going to talk about Optimus Prime's uh, underpants. But uh, what do you think about Ratchet's arm? <laughs> you guys both completely glossed over Ratchet's arm. I about shit myself. I was like, <laughs> just, just, just tore off his arm. Deleted. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I really wanted him to be in more pain. <laughs> when he crypt his arm off, he, you know, Ratchet kind of went, you know, and I'm thinking, yeah, that should hurt. He just tore off your arm. You know, I mean, I, I think if my arm got torn off, I'd be in blinding pain up until the point where I bled out. But they're robots. I suppose, you know, I might, I might buy that. Their, yeah. their pain receptors aren't the same as ours. Otherwise, we, we'd be fucked. Yeah, this will come up later when we get to part two, because I have a note about this, and Kevin will talk about this in his Cybertronian correspondence. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, but they bring, in, they bring in the Dinobots. And, yeah. you know, it seems like they're trying to touch all the bases. I'm trying to touch on everything they've done in this season before they wrap it up. And it, you know, it's going to come up later in my discussion. But you know, they they bring in the Dinobots. Hey, the gang's all here. Uh, you know, now we can move on and and really round things out properly. But uh, Bumblebee, and this is this is classic irony for you. Bumblebee shows up uh, and buys Megatron just enough time to rebuild himself before Starscream can kill him. Yeah, because you, you know Starscream wants to kill just blow up his head so bad he can taste it and instead he gets sidetracked and chases after Bumblebee Yeah, not knowing that the key is on its way to completely revive Megatron he thinks he's got all the time in the world he's just gonna you know, do some Bumblebee juggling <laughs> uh, which was awesome yeah. you know? so he's gonna do some Bumblebee juggling you know and get rid of the little yellow guy and then head down and off Megatron you know you get a twofer but uh he doesn't. He, he dicks around, and Megatron ends up revived. If only Starscream had tossed Bumblebee at Megatron's head as soon as he entered. Yeah. Because it, it was like it was. It was all. It couldn't have been cued better. He said, 
anybody could just walk right in and kill you. And yep. then yeah, and then boom, in walks Bumblebee and starts firing. And that's and that's when the whole thing of you interrupted my speech. <laughs> that's right. You know, if he had been less worried about pontificating, you know, and more worried about killing off Megatron, he could have just stepped out of the way. And, you know, the stinger blast would have went right past him and hit Megatron in the head. And that would have yep. been it. Problem solved. Uh, but no, he was more worried about monologuing. And you know, game. Like said, yeah. <laughs> it's like, anyone could come in here and kill you. Oh, like this little guy here, you know. Would have been easy. But, uh, yeah, he dicked around and uh, lost his opportunity. Yep. But that's that's about what I got. All right, so we are going to move on to part two of Megatron Rising, and now that Megatron's body is rebuilt, designed to blend in on Earth, Optimus Prime, Prowl, and Bulkhead battle valiantly against him, only to get brutally beaten. Megatron destroys Starscream's life spark by Sari's key, so punishing him for his betrayal. Meanwhile, Ratchet reuses Sari rescues not reuses rescues, sorry. Sorry, and drives Black Arachne away. The battle between Optimus and Megatron leads them back to the Autobot ship, and Megatron gets his hands on the AllSpark. Then Optimus Prime uses Sari's key to tackle Megatron, destroys the AllSpark, and causes Megatron some serious damage. Optimus returns the key to Sari for safekeeping and tells her that the key is obviously too valuable for mere Autobots to handle. Soon after, she starts to wonder where her father is. In the end, it is revealed that Megatron has kidnapped Isaac Sundak for some evil plan. <laughs> some evil plan. La it took me about, I don't know, the first ten minutes of this episode to even make a note because my first note, lots and lots of action. Yeah. It's a I mean, epic, I, epic, I, epic I know battle. this is a two-parter and all that stuff and it's continuing from the last part and all that, but I mean, it's like... They just hit you with the action. Boom, boom, boom. Megatron's here. Megatron's going to kick your aft. And <laughs> this, that, and the other thing. Um, and Megatron really takes it to Optimus. I mean, he kicks his ass all over the parking lot. He kicks everybody's ass. Yep. I mean, they make it pretty clear very early on that Megatron is stronger than Bulkhead. He's faster than Prowl. And he can fight better than Prime. Yep. And you know, if Bumblebee was down there, instead of you know, being manhandled by Starscream, he would have been first to go. Oh, yeah. Easily. Give me a piece. How about two? <laughs> Dude, I'll take two. Yeah, that's Stop exactly it. what would have happened. Poor Jazz. <laughs> Leave Jazz's death alone. Uh, now, I know this isn't, um, this isn't technically true, but I thought it was at the time of watching this episode, and I made this note. So Megatron's punch of key in your body is actually what made Starscream immortal. Nice. Now, I know that isn't... Uh, I think it led up to it, or it, it'll lead up to it, but I I don't know. It was just an observation. I, it I might. I mean, as far as I can tell, anytime the key plugs into a Cybertronian, they get healed. So if anything, it kept him from killing Starscream outright. Right. Exactly, yeah. Uh, just a little mini note. Sky Spy again, yay! Because I like seeing the G1 Sky Spy satellite. I thought they always think that's cool. Yeah, when he, uh, I should say, when Ratchet uh, talks to Teletran One again, I, I listen really closely, and yeah, it's 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 more uh, Terra Strong than it is Terra. It's it's not just more Terra Strong. It, it is, is Terra strong. strong. I pointed that. I I proved that to you a couple episodes ago. I know, I know. But again, I, I this time I was really listening, and I'm like, yeah, that that it's it's less uh, you know squeaky than what I'm used to hearing from Terra. So yeah, I was the ship fun. flies again. So not even not even the second season, the end of the first season, the ship flies. Yeah, that's cool. It doesn't fly very far. No, but it still flies. Uh, Kevin will bring this up later in his Cybertronian correspondence, but I have to bring it up as well. Why, how is Sari biting Black Arachnia going to hurt the damn robot? Like, okay, I get that she's half organic, but seriously, that is metal. 
<laughs> she's got a very strong teeth for an eight-year-old. She wow. drinks lots of milk. <laughs> and eats lots of apples. Yeah. You know, what I couldn't understand is why is Black Arachnia even in the two-parter? I mean, basically, her purpose in this sh in the two-parter is to be sorry. Well, number one, it, it's it's to wrap up loose ends because she appeared earlier in the season. But ma basically here, it's to give sorry a piggyback ride back to Lake Erie. I mean, that and... after this, she doesn't even show up anymore. Well, for well, a while. Well, she shows up later. Much later, yeah. But I yeah. mean, it's like, why, why bother? And yeah, it just... It would just kind of aggravated me. It's like, well, she's she, sorry. Could have picked up a bicycle, and rode to Lake Erie, you know, and been like, "Hey, swing the ship over here and pick me up." Yeah, it, it, it would have served the same purpose. It just didn't make sense to have Black Arachnia there. You know how we have the poke, right? Well, in this episode, we have the pokel, punch of kill lug nut. You talk too much. <laughs> Because Bulkhead yeah. activated the button before Lugnut could activate it himself. Yeah, that was sheer brilliance right there on his part, which is far smarter than Bulkhead usually is. Because yeah, Lugnut exactly. was just trouncing him up until that point. Yeah. Would you like an axe with that gun blast, Megatron? <laughs> I got Because axe. Megatron's blasting all the other Autobots, Optimus uses his jet axe, flies up, and just whoosh, sticks it right into Megatron's shoulder, and Megatron wrenches forward. He's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's a lucky shot. Yeah. Now, this will come back, this next note will come back at the very end of Season 2 when a piece of Sari's clothing on her arm, a piece of her sleeve gets ripped off or spoiler. damaged. Spoiler! No, it's not a spoiler. I'm just saying the next note, because it the note is about what happens in this episode, but... It will continue until the next season at the very end of the season two when she has, right. um, you know, a paper cut, an injury. Uh, <laughs> oh. Sorry, we may not make it out alive. There is something I need to tell you. Yeah. Would have been this, nice. To, yeah, would have been nice to fill that in a little better. Yeah, but they fill it in a heck of a lot better from the end of season two going into season three. Well, I mean, here it's like. There's something I have to tell you, and it, it could have been like, I'm sorry I haven't done right by you in the past. I've been a horrible father. I've let my work overtake all my time, but I love you. What he really <laughs> wanted to say was... Yeah, he's I'm a mama yeah. too! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it could have been something sweet, and that's kind of what I expected. I'm, I, I, I'm not sure what the writers had in mind when they first wrote that. Maybe they did say... Or maybe they did have something in mind more toward that. There, there seemed to be a lot in this episode that was left out, and and I want to bring that up later. But, you know, one of those things could have been a very heartfelt, meaningful, possibly goodbye from a father to a daughter. Yeah. Not oh, by the way, in another season we're gonna find out something horrible about you that I might as well tell you now. <laughs> You're going to die. You have cancer. <laughs> I thought I just. Not tell you about it. Sorry. Well, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Your professor uh, princess is an angry archer's child. I stole you. I stole oh my you. <laughs> God, that's horrible. Forsooth. Stop it. Uh, you want heat? I'll give you more than you can handle. Oh, slag, not again. He's <laughs> bent over. No, it's... <laughs> They finally figure out, Prowl figures out, Blitzwing's personalities are tied into his, at least the Ice personality and the uh, and, and the Heat personality yeah. are tied into his alt modes. The Ice personality is the jet, the Heat personality is the tank, and then the random personality is just any of it. Right. Why they wouldn't so figure you, this when out you mess sooner, with the ball, I don't know. Get the horns? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They should have figured that out a long time ago, though. Yeah. Uh, you want power? Have your fill. I, I, another, you know, regardless of how dickish Optimus was in this episode, when he was fighting Megatron, he has some pretty cool lines in. Well, I think by the time he actually fights Megatron, he's kind of, you know, redeemed himself a little bit. 
Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, basically, he yeah, he did call them all undisciplined, insubordinate malfunctions. But, at, <laughs> <laughs> which is just kind of kind of rude. But at, by the end, you know, he, he apologizes to his team and basically says, you know, I'm sorry for being a giant dick. Yeah. Or, you know, a giant gick. Yeah, a tiny one. God. Uh, you all fought like Autobots. What are they going to fight like? Cheesy GoBots from the 80s? I mean, Jesus Christ, of course they're going to fight like Autobots. Uh, God, Optimus, you had a really great line, and then you go and, and fuck it up with this. Well, they could have been fighting like the Autobot Elite Guard. That would have been better. Oh. <laughs> well, that's, it's funny, too, because that's what uh, Bumblebee says. He's like, you know, there's no Autobot, or Prime says there's no Autobots I'd rather be fighting with, and Bumblebee says... Not even the elite guard, because yeah. I wouldn't mind having them here right about now. <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't you... realize they're going to come in one more episode, but true. Four episodes later, Bumblebee himself will be in the elite guard. No, I'm kidding. Why are we talking about it this? <laughs> this? Yes. Anyways, it doesn't happen. Uh, I'm kidding. It yeah. doesn't happen yet. Uh, Sorry, or Kevin. All. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's Michael's fault again. I didn't do it this time. <laughs> At the very end. Are you comfortable in your chair? <laughs> Once again, your ass is in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> it appears, Professor, our fates are intertwined once more. Your Schwartz is very small. <laughs> Steve, what do you have for this one? For the second part of the Megatron Rising two-parter? Um, I like the dual-wielding sword Megatron. Yeah. Yeah, cool. He's just like I will slice and dice. He's like Ninja Megatron, man. Those swords I, are amazingly cool. I like I'm how so it's hollow in the center. That. Yeah. What'd you say, Michael? Yeah, I guess he didn't say anything. What else you got, Steve? I was saying I like how the swords are hollow in the center. It just makes yeah. the sword even <sighs> more badass. Sorry. Yeah. Um. I like how Megatron finally gets a little bit of revenge on Starscream, of course. Yep. You know, that's that's always to be awesome. Oh, yes. Uh, I like where Megatron gets blown to hell after he gets rebuilt. Big explosion. <laughs> Big boom. Because if you look at the shot before we see the fact that he's holding Professor Sumback in his chair, oh, I mean Megatron's hand, um, if you just look at his face, it's a s different angle on his face, but if you, if you like, put that next to the, the TFTM shot of Megatron standing up and all scraggly looking after battling Optimus, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, that was cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this makes two giant explosions that Megatron should never have walked away from. Yeah, exactly. And yet, somehow, he still comes in ahead. <laughs> He's a Megatron. Uh, I like like the uh, kind of angled arc cave, or into the, the mountainside. Yeah, I was going to try to make it, an arc it, reference it ref to it. Yeah, it does reference G1. To some degree. The only problem with it, though, is that it's, like, halfway up the freaking mountain. It's not at the base. It's not at the base of the mountain, so that that's why I never made the... I, I get that's what they were going for, but I, I never wanted to even bring it up as far as potentially being a G1 reference, because it would for me, it would only have been a G1 reference if it crashed into the very bottom of the mountain and they, you know, had some sort of opening... Whereas where it actually crashes is like halfway up the mountain. Well, it's not even a mountain. It's like the caldera of the crater. Yeah. So it's like, is the front end sticking out the other side of the volcano? Or how does that work? <laughs> but no, I, th I think it totally looks very G1. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I like, I like this episode, though. This episode is definitely... I mean, the whole two-parter is good, but I like the the overall theme they were going for with Megatron in this. Despite the fact that they had to blow him away again. Right. Yes. Michael, what about you for part two? 
uh, Megatron's best line? Transform and rise up. Yep. Yeah. Can't believe you guys glossed over that one. That was I, I practically cheered when he said that. Well, that's also <laughs> in uh, Mike's commercials for the yeah. podcast. <laughs> ah, yeah, no, that was great. I totally dug that. Uh, the plan here is for the Autobots to get into the into the into the Ark, you know, get back into the ship, right, and lead the Decepticons off planet. But they don't get that far; they get, you know, shot down, and they end up on Dinobot Island. So the question becomes: Why didn't the Dinobots show up here? This would have been the perfect place for them to join the fray. I mean, especially after they made a, a specific run to Dinobot Island in the last episode to recruit their help. Yeah. And they didn't seem altogether, you know, on board in the last episode, right? But they didn't seem like they were like, screw you guys, we're not helping. So it, it, it seemed to me like they were in the script originally, or maybe if they had gotten 10 more minutes to put into the battle that the Dinobots would have shown up and actually done something. That would have been nice. No, it just it just made sense to me. And it, it, it just didn't make sense that they'd go through all the effort of recruiting them in the last episode and then go to the island in their ship and then not have them show up. Yeah. Uh, the the only other thing I could, I really had was uh, Bumblebee's greatest strength. <laughs> obnoxious personality. Yeah. Is that, is that your jet mode? Or did your pal Lugnut take a dump? <laughs> <laughs> take a, yeah, take, take a dump on your head. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yeah, the key word here being dump. What did he say? He, he said, take, how do you dump out some spare parts? Yeah, he said, said something I, like that. I, I heard it as take a dump, and it, it just made me <laughs> giggle. But that's all I had for this one. I really liked this one. It was really cool. I just felt that there was huge chunks missing. Yeah. Um, the one thing I don't particularly like from going from season one into season two is how they just kind of like, like the story's there, but it's like, okay, season one ends and then season two starts with elite guard, but it seems like six months has passed since, since this Megatron rising. It's like, Again, the time in the animated universe is completely fucked up because it seems like too much time has passed between this episode and, and the season two premiere. It's like this really isn't a cliffhanger at all. Like the cliffhanger is really part one of this episode. You know, uh, I, yeah, I can see that. You know, Megatron appears, and okay, we'll see you next season. Yeah. But yeah, they go exactly. and do part two where they show this giant battle. They show the all spark dispersing or what did getting destroyed, whatever. Right. And then supposedly Megatron's destroyed. And, 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 and the cliffhanger is that he's captured some deck again. And then, Oh, Hey, see you next season, kids. It's like, I, I don't know. I, yeah, where is I, the cliffhanger here? Yeah. There isn't one. Yeah. Well, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of gap. In between season one and season two, no, and I understand that. As they far didn't as make like, you wait six months, right? And I and I understand that, but I, I'm I'm just saying, like, the just the time frame. It's like it ends with you know the sum deck thing with him being in Megatron's hand, and then season two when we get to it. And Kevin, sorry if we're spoiling anything for you. I'm not trying to here. But season two, when we get to it, season two opens with, oh, hey, there's a giant ship coming in. Optimus is like, oh, I know. I know exactly what that is. Let's go. You know, it's like it doesn't it doesn't fully carry over. It, it would have been better if they found a way to have, you know, Megatron rising. Right. The first part one be that's it. Season finale. That's it. And then use part two to be the season two premiere. Yeah, well, that, I, I that makes sense. It's a shame they didn't do it that way because that would have been a nice cliffhanger. I mean, it, again, if they would make you wait six months between 
the end of season one, the beginning of season two, I could see that. But the way it was like two weeks. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, tune in, you know, five months from now for the to find out what happens. I mean, they could have ended it with, you know, Megatron getting his new body and then immediately beating the crap out of all the Autobots, and then, boom, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, what happens now? How <laughs> how are they going to recover from that? Yeah. Yeah, you know, the obvious answer being Starscream, but you know, it would have been cool if you didn't know that for six months. Yeah. I mean, they used to do stuff like that in Beast Wars all the time, where, like, oh my God, uh, you know, Optimus Primal just died again, and you know, <laughs> it's like, what, well, he just sacrificed himself. What, what, how are they gonna, how are they gonna recover from this? Yeah. You know, and the cool thing about Beast Wars is it took a couple episodes for them to recover from that. They didn't yeah. just bring him back in the next season. Yeah. Um. So, final thoughts on the two-parter, Steve. Um, definitely one, two of the better episodes out of the whole season. Mm Mm-hmm. Michael? Yeah, again, I I really liked uh, Megatron Rising. I like that, you know, Megatron came back. Uh, I I like that uh, they they brought the whole gang in. Not the humans, per se, but, and, and not really locked down but everybody else was in there everyone that they had met previously yeah. everything uh, you know they brought back black arachnia they they touched on her for apparently no reason uh they brought back the dinobots they touched on them briefly for apparently no reason uh <laughs> you know <laughs> and it was it was nice i really liked it uh, i think they could have fleshed it out a little better though yeah you know i i'm i'm on the same way i i think that if if Megatron Rising Part 1 was the season finale and it was just, you know, just one episode and then have the other one as the season two premiere, it would have been a hell of a lot better as far as cliffhangers. But I, I don't know. I do like it. It is, as Steve said, it is one of the better ones. So I think with that, we're going to take a break. Uh, you're going to hear some uh, some clips, some audio stuff, and you're also going to hear Kevin's thoughts on Nature Calls and the Megatron Rising 2 part Transformation Animation Podcast will be back after these messages. Mm, podcast good! Here's quote number one. We are going camping, as in leaving the comfort of civilization, as in no TV, no music, no games, as in my circuits are going to fry from boredom. Here's quote number two. Bath time, kids! And quote number three. Okay, what's his malfunction? Technical glitch. It happens. A lot, actually. (laughs) It is not a glitch. It is Megatron, and he commands us to deliver him the key. Megatron? Did you just say Megatron? Did he just say Megatron? There is no Megatron! Megatron is offline! Terminated! I did it myself! Saw it myself! We don't have enough Energon cubes to power a full-scale assault. It appears that Decepticons are mobilizing for a full-scale assault. You interrupted my speech! Finally, quote number four. (sighs) Master, I am not worthy! I am not worthy! We're not worthy! What happened to your body? Soundwave, jam that transmission! Rumble frenzy, ravage that bat, eject, operation interference. No, there will be no Operation Interference. I am TFG1 Mike, and you should be listening to my very first podcast, the TFG1 Podcast. 24 episodes covering the entire U.S. run of the 1984 Transformers cartoon. I also have a few supplemental episodes and an interview with Stan Bush. I bring in guest hosts who will be full-time co-hosts in Steve Megatron and fan of the show, now co-host, Pecan Court Michael. So check out the TFG1 podcast. You can find it on iTunes and the web at www.geekcastradio.com. Transform and roll out. Ah, welcome to my throne room, Future Tales. The Beast Unleashed podcast is over, not gone. You can hear more of this great podcast discussing all the episodes of Beast Wars and Beast Machines on geekcastradio.com 
We include voice actor and writer interviews with stellar hosting by Steve, Mike, and Michael. Head on over to iTunes or the net, or else I will send you my vehicles to extract your spark and destroy you. <laughs> yes. Hey guys, it's Optimus Solo, your Cybertronian correspondent, giving you my thoughts on episodes 14 through 16. Let's start with episode 14, which is entitled Nature Calls, and it's written by Todd Casey. Um, camping? Barnacle Monster? Yeah, not a good start to this episode. Um, the low point of the episode is when Optimus Prime praises Sorry for her ingenuity. Yes, because it is ingenious to stick your key in any freaking object in your near vicinity. Yes, that's ingenuity, folks. Stick your key in anything and everything. Um, so that was the low point. I don't know, this episode, I'm not really going to say much about it because there wasn't much to talk about. I mean, it's a pretty pointless episode. Uh, it has no relevance, really, to the bigger picture. It's it's basically like a one-off episode, minus the ending where um, Sundak gets the uh, piece of Decepticon framework, body, etc., whatever you want to call it, um, with the Decepticon symbol on it there. So that was the only, you know, relevant part of the episode. Otherwise, it was a camping, a Transformers Go Camping episode. So we've seen the Transformers go trick-or-treating, um, celebrate a birthday party, we've uh, seen them cry, we've seen them take naps, and now we've seen them go camping. Uh, Nature Calls, you get a 4 out of 10. Episode 15, Megatron Rising, Part 1, written by Marsha Griffin. Uh, first of all, the Decepticon interaction between Lugnut and Starscream is fantastic. Um, when Lugnut is actually speaking to Megatron, but Starscream is standing in front of him, and Starscream thinks he's talking to him, and he's confused, and that was just a whole great scene. Um, that's one of the best scenes I've seen in a while on this series. Um and then my, my major problem with this episode, I, I, I generally like this episode, but my major problem is the, the Transformers, and this kind of is weird because I talked about this in my last correspondence, they finally realized that Sari shouldn't have the freaking key. All right, Sari should not have the key. She's a human. Megatron should be able to take it from her whenever he darn well pleases. Um, so Sari shouldn't have the key, and they finally realize that. But the way they execute this is stupid. Um, it's stupid that they execute this as, number one, this is how Megatron is going to get the key because Sorry doesn't have it. And also, the way Prime does it, he comes across as a complete ass. Um, so I like the idea that they were finally realized that Sorry doesn't need the key, but the way they executed this is terrible. And I'm talking about the writing here. Megatron, if, if the Decepticons could get it from Ratchet that easy, they could have got it from Sorry at any point. Come on. It is stupid that Sorry is the holder of the key and that they entrust a human to hold the key. So it was a good idea to get it away from her. It's stupid that then they use that as why Megatron gets the key, and it's because Sorry didn't have it. That's, that's weak. Um, and then Optimus Prime not only is an ass in this episode, but he also reverts back into Rodimus Prime mode um, with all his I'm not good enough and I'm going to feel sorry for myself and self-pity, etc. So that was a weak point, too. They should have just named this character Rodimus Prime and not had Optimus Prime in this series at all. Um, the episode, though, I don't want to make it sound like it's a bad episode. The episode's good. The episode is way more relevant than Nature Calls. Um, we have Megatron getting his body back. We have Megatron, you know, rising, as the title suggests. And Megatron's robot mode is awesome. Uh, I only have one slight complaint, and that is his forehead or the or his face is, is kind of weird. It's like too big of a forehead or something, but overall his his whole form is, is pretty epic. Um, he's, he's a kick-ass villain. And then we move right into the second part of this, which I hate how they always do this, but cartoons especially always do this, where they have two different writers write a first part and a second part. I always think that the fir person who writes the first part should write the second part. But now Marty Eisenberg takes over and writes the second part. Um... The low point of this episode and my what the fuck moment is when Sari bites Black Arachnia, and apparently a human biting a piece of metal hurts Black Arachnia so much that she throws Sari up in the air and Ratchet grabs her. What the fuck, like I said. Um, and here's the, the, the bad part the Allspark gets 
destroyed, so to speak. And Optimus Prime utters the lines, Now the key is more powerful than... Or is this most powerful artifact in the universe. So fuck. Now the key is even more powerful than it was before? And then he says it's too important to be protected by Autobots. No, Autobots are who should be protecting it. I don't understand the fact that the human is the one who should be protecting the key. Give me a fucking break. But... Let's not take away from the epicness of Megatron rising, his battle, the the multiple battles between the Autobots and the Decepticons. These two, uh, the two part of this episode is is so relevant compared to when Nature Calls and compared to most of the episodes we talked about last time that I'm giving this two parter a seven out of ten. I, it could have been done a little bit better. It could have been even more epic, but. We had the Dinobots, we had Black Arachnid, we had Megatron getting his body, we had a lot of cool stuff. So, 7 out of 10, not bad. I, I kind of enjoyed this episode. So, I'll send it back to the guys on Earth and hear their thoughts, final thoughts, on what I had to say about Nature Calls and Megatron Rising. Now back to Transformation Animation Podcast. We are back here on Earth. Thank you to the Cybertronian correspondent, Optimus Solo. Uh, Steve, do you have anything to respond to Kevin on Nature Calls? Agree with him. Michael, I have to agree with yeah. I I may not always agree with with uh, his verbiage, right? But <laughs> I kind of have to agree with his opinion on this one. Yeah, and I didn't really write anything down because I I I've, I've kind of already said it in the episode today. But nature calls. I really really sympathized and agreed with Bumblebee. We don't. We need to just get out of this stupid nature. <laughs> <laughs> stupid nature. Uh, anything for part one of Megatron Rising, Steve, to respond to Kevin? Uh, I pretty much agree with everything he said. Michael. Sigh. I agree too. I know you don't want any spoilers, so I can't say anything about uh, why Sorry is the keymaster. <laughs> Are you the gatekeeper? <laughs> I was I was hoping that people would pick up on the Ghostbusters reference. <laughs> She's not quite as hot as uh you nah. know, 1980s Sigourney Weaver, but uh first of all, eight year old little girl. Let's not go there, Michael. Uh, <laughs> Sigourney Weaver was like well in her thirties by the time. I know that. I'm not talking I'm talking out. about sorry. You said she's not as hot as Sigourney back in the eighties. Oh. Sorry's an eight year old little girl. Give it a couple seasons. Oh, God. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Anything on part two of Megatron Rising? Nay. So apparently we all agree with you, Kevin. Sadly. I like to argue with Kevin. I really do. <laughs> it's like, what do you know? you never even seen this shit. What are you talking about? But... Uh-huh. <laughs> but, uh, but no, no, I, I, I almost want when we do... Um, when we do the season one recap, I almost want to bring him on the show and have the four of us just talk about the entire season. I, I almost really want to bring him on the show. I don't um, see why not. I mean, for the recap, let's do it. There you go. Thank you for joining us here on Transformation Animation Podcast. There's several ways to get in contact with us or leave feedback for the show. Visit the website, geekcastradio.com. You can comment on each episode post. We haven't been getting a lot of comments on anything lately. Um, Come on, people. Leave the show's feedback in iTunes. No, there are no new iTunes reviews this week. Go leave reviews, people. Follow us on Twitter. The show name there is TFA Podcast. Mine is TFGO and Mike. Steve, what is your Twitter? SCP21. Whatever happened to burnt toast? And burnt Michael? <laughs> Pecan CT Michael. Become a fan on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash geekcast or radio network. As I said before, the voicemail line is back up and running. Tell us the show you're leaving the message for and your name. 502-526-5821. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Transformation Animation Podcast. I wish you'll join us next time when we will be doing the Season 1 recap and possibly have Kevin on the show. We'll actually bring him back from Cybertron. For now, I am TFG1 Mike with... Michael Wilson and Steve Megatron Phillips. We'll tap you again next week. I wonder how much airfare from Cybertron is. Can we afford that in our budget? What we budget? have a budget. <laughs>
<laughs> it's expensive. You guys haven't been dipping in the petty cash? Because cause I have. You want to send some of that petty cash my way, damn it? <laughs> oh, God. I, I'm having bad, bad, bad don't tell mom the babysitter's dead flashbacks. <laughs> hey, wait. We rented that movie. Really? <laughs> yeah. Transform and roll out. <laughs>